We're joined by Dr. Emily Ramirez, Director of the Institute for Health Promotion Research and Professor of Epidemiology and Biostatistics at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio. She is also Associate Director of Cancer Health Disparities at the Cancer Therapy Research Center in San Antonio. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Would you describe your study into the extent of interest among Latinas to test for gene mutations associated with breast cancer? We had a study funded by the Susan G. Komen Foundation to look at um, Hispanics women interested interest in being tested for uh, if they were carriers of the BRCA1 or 2 mutation. Um, so we were able to um, work with physicians who told us that these were women that were at risk or uh, had breast cancer. Um, so we were able to interview them and ask them um, to to learn more about their knowledge and their attitudes with regards to genetic testing. Uh, and what we found is that uh, Hispanic women were interested in being uh, learning more about genetic testing and were a little hesitant about being tested for, for genetics, but if they had a biological daughter, they seemed to have more interest in, um, in, in receiving the test so that they could maybe protect their daughters, that, that if they had the carrier, then they wanted to make sure that they got their daughters, got the most current care available for them. Um, so what we're trying to do with this new information is, is develop some educational materials so that we can have a larger reach to help them to, to um, reduce any barriers and any uh, concerns that they may have about the test itself and to educate them about what it can tell them and how they can use that information. What are some factors associated with interest or lack of interest in genetic testing? Now, you mentioned people having a daughter. Yeah, in terms of some of the interest, we really found that family plays an important part. That uh, of the women who had breast cancer and their family members were with them, and if there was concurrence about what they understood about genetic testing, there was a higher um, more likelihood that they would go ahead and ask for the genetic test and or if they had a biological daughter they were also more interested in going through the testing. You have been involved in managing national and statewide communications programs using targeted Latino young adult populations for more than 25 years. Would you discuss some of your projects? Yes, we've been very proud that um, we've had a, a national program looking at cancer research training and awareness in the Latino populations. Uh, we have sites in New York, Miami, San Francisco, San Diego, San Antonio, and the lower Rio Grande Valley here in Texas. And it's, it started at first, um, the first five years focused on what do we know about the different types of Latino populations. And the, region, the reason we picked the, the five sites across the U.S. is each one represented a different Hispanic population. For example, in Miami, we were looking predominantly at Cuban Americans. In New York, we were focusing predominantly on Puerto Rican communities. In San Francisco, we were looking at more Central Americans. And then in San Diego and Texas, we were comparing populations that were near the border, but in an urban and kind of rural uh, setting. And what we found out is that there were some differences with regard to knowledge about breast and cervical cancer screening among uh, our Hispanic populations and that uh, Cuban Americans uh, and Central Americans resembled more about what we know in white women in contrast to Mexican Americans and Puerto Ricans uh, probably do a little bit more to socioeconomic and educational status uh, had less knowledge about how to go about uh, getting screening for breast and cervical cancer. Um, so that was our first phase of our study. The second phase focused on what happens when a woman is diagnosed with um, breast cancer, what happens in the clinic. And uh, we, uh, we wanted to, we did a needs assessment and what we found out is that women, uh, Hispanic women who were diagnosed with breast cancer were taking longer to get into treatment. Um, and so we used that data then to go into another study to, to um, explore the use of what we call in Spanish a promotora, kind of a community health educator or a lay health worker to partner that person with the physician and nursing staff in the clinic to helping that patient, making sure that there weren't any barriers uh, for coming in for follow-up on their additional tests that they might need. Physicians were telling us we're losing them to follow-up and we don't understand why. So once we partnered them with a lay health educator, we were, we're, um, or the results are still out, but we hope that to show that we have reduced the time from time of diagnosis to time of getting into treatment. Um, so that's the second phase of our study. And then our new phase, uh, 
of our Redes en Acción study, again, in the same national site, so we're able to look at both um, regional and ethnic um, within Hispanic populations, the different ethnic differences. The third phase is focusing on breast cancer survivors, so we've been able to look at the full continuum. Now, of a woman who has survived breast cancer, what's going on in her community? What does her quality of life look like? Is she continuing to get her care? Uh, and so we're also using our Promotora model and pairing that, and we'll be working with the uh, Lance Armstrong at Live a Foundation in getting people to call the Livestrong 1-800 uh, number for more information on survivor care. Um, so I, we're excited to see these, um, this whole continuum from you know, increasing knowledge and education about cancer all the way now through survivorship. So that was one element. In each of our studies over the years, we've had to have a research component. So that was our major uh, studies. And then the second component was looking at training. Uh, as, as you've well heard, that we don't have enough uh, minorities in the health professions. And so, and much less, uh, fewer even go into research. We have about less than 3% of the Latino community of uh, academics with, with a, a PhD. So we're really trying to increase the pipeline of Latinos who are interested in participating in cancer research. So we had a mentoring program. We were able to offer pilot funding for these um, investigators to become successful. So we've now had about 200 um, individuals that we've been able to mentor over the years and have gone through our programs. Those that have succeeded and gone on have also been very successful in bringing research dollars to their communities to help improve the health of uh, Hispanic women in, in their communities. And the third component was outreach and education. That's something that we can't stop. Oftentimes we get funded to do research, but we don't get the outreach and education component. So consistently we've been participating in health fairs, you know, providing uh, information through uh, community lectures and so forth, as well as professional education. And collectively our sites have provided over 2,000 uh, venues of, of educational contact points that they've had over the years. What, in your estimation, are the biggest challenges facing the Hispanic community when it comes to cancer in general and specifically breast cancer? The biggest challenge that we see in the Hispanic community is really access to care. When you really get down to that, it's access to care and low, lower socioeconomic status. Our, our community is less likely to have insurance. Uh, and they're less likely to go in to see the physician, and especially now in the economic straits that, that all our country is in right now, um, people are putting their health care on hold. You know, it's, it's, it's expensive. Um, but we tried to tell them that prevention is very important. If you come in and get screened and we're able to diagnose something early, you know, the likelihood of you getting an appropriate treatment and being successful uh, is really critical. And so this is a message that we can't stop giving out, that, you know, for them not to give up hope and to really uh, be more more, more vigilant about their health care. And then the other message is for them to be, um, the one thing that they can do personally is to really exercise and to watch their weight as we're seeing that um, as women increase uh, after menopause in terms of their weight, their weight increases after menopause and makes them at a higher risk for breast cancer, we're trying to get that message out that they really need to, to uh, exercise and control their weight as well. In your estimation, what are some effective means for addressing the gaps that you see in, in treatment for Hispanics? In terms of re closing the gaps, we, we really need to uh, work very closely with our community clinics. We need to reduce any fear that our community has. A lot of the Latino community says, you know, if they hear the word cancer, it's very fearful for them, and it almost shuts down all the, the communications. So what we've tried to do is develop educational materials to educate them about genetic testing, to educate them that you know, women do survive breast cancer. And so we've done role model stories of women who've been uh, resilient and what they went through in terms of their treatment and how they're doing now. And sharing those stories so they can see someone like themselves having been successful in coming in for treatment and that, you know, cancer is not synonymous with death and that if they can just come in early to get treated. So we need to continue our educational efforts to, to close that gap. Dr. Ramirez, thank you so much. Thank you. It was really a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you.